Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am the treasurer of the Goldsmith Racialized Postgraduate Network. And we are a group of students at Goldsmith, mostly um, doctoral researchers who identify as racialized. Um, our work is to carve a space for ourselves at Goldsmith. Um, and we have a project called the Counter Cannon Challenge, where we sort of track and evaluate our the percentage of racialized scholars that we and others um, cite in our works. Um, as part of that challenge, we try to introduce ourselves and each other to the works of racialized uh, scholars so that we are introduced to people to cite in our works. Um, and this is, I think this is the seventh of the series so far, and we want to welcome Professor Makhali. Thank you for um, joining us today. Um, I was introduced to your work by my um, by my supervisor, uh, Dr. Brian Elaine, who asked me to read Black <laughs> software. I wasn't actually sure why, <laughs> because my research is um, on housing and Black men. Um, but right away, I I was struck by your work. Um, by the story of alienation and um, uh, exclusion and that in technology and advancements in modernity. Um, and those are themes that are present in my work. And um, for those reasons and many more, I, I really wanted to hear more from you. And so really excited to have you here today. So on that, <laughs> on that note, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, great to be here with you and uh, learn a little bit about what you all are, are doing, which I think is uh, absolutely great and necessary. And so, um, you know, a couple of things just sort of popped in my mind as you were doing that brief introduction. Number one was um, something that we can come back to uh, and talk about later if, uh, if you all uh, wish, but um, uh, the work uh, that I've done, and then um, some recent work um, by uh, a scholar named Dean Freelon um, and a group of other folks. Uh, Dean is a data scientist um, and political communication scholar uh, now at the University of North Carolina, um, who just did a recent uh, study, large scale study of citation networks and disparities in uh, communication. And that was following a project that myself and um, some other collaborators did uh, a few years back that was called hashtag communication so white, where we um, did uh, a study as well of uh, journal citations, looking at minoritized scholars and relationships of who gets cited, who gets published, all those kinds of things. So great to, to hear that that idea about citations um, is a kind of driver of uh, this work that you're doing, because I think it is so um, important to uh, think about those disparities and obviously the ways that they uh, negatively affect um, uh, um, racialized scholars. Um, and uh, you know, so efforts to change that. The other thing that uh, popped in my mind was your your interest in, in housing, which I have a a long connection to. So I'll um, I'll try to weave that in here somewhere. And if I don't, uh, definitely uh, kind of nudge me back back to it because it's been a a prominent area of my uh, work, but sort of adjacent to uh, my research uh, trajectory and so forth. So. So I thought what I would maybe do, um, uh, which is something that I don't often get a chance to do, but I like to, which is to kind of run you through the arc of my work um, uh, the, in sort of the long story beginning uh, where you all are uh, in graduate school and kind of given the story and narrative of how uh, my work and scholarship has evolved uh, over this uh, time period. Um, so I'll lay all that out, kind of bring us up to the present with uh, Black Software and some things, and then open it up for questions and discussion and so forth. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> uh, I started my graduate school career um, 
not so much reluctantly, but a little bit uh, ambivalently. Uh, I was one of those folks who, you know, did not grow up, you know, with an aspiration of becoming a researcher, scholar, professor. Um, that kind of evolved um, uh, up through the time that I was doing a master's degree at the University of Oklahoma um, and started to understand um, that this was something that I uh, wanted to do, could do. Um, interestingly enough, that sort of realization came because of um, two very prominent Black scholars uh, that I had the opportunity to uh, engage with during that time. And that was the first time throughout my undergraduate career and the time up uh, to the start of that uh, master's program that I'd ever had any um, non-white professors uh, and black professors in particular. And so those two folks uh, really kind of showed me um, uh, the value and so forth of this particular uh, profession and, and career trajectory. And so I entered um, my doctoral career, you know, with a, a multitude of, of interests. And so uh, I think a lot of students that we have today that I work with, um, you know, they come in, you come in with a pretty, uh, not so much narrow, but, you know, we ask folks to tell us before we let you in, what do you want to do? What do you want to focus on? What's your, you know, the research questions that are most burning? Um, and I had none of those things when I entered my uh, PhD program. I wanted to be, uh, I wanted to get a PhD. I wanted to do that in communication. And that was about as far as I had um, had gotten. Um, so I went to a, um, uh, the school at University of Oklahoma, the communication uh, department was a kind of a traditional Midwestern communication department. It was broken down into those kinds of siloed areas of mass comm and interpersonal communication and uh, organizational communication, uh, things like that. Um, and so the person I studied with uh, was in the mass communication area um, and had a long background that was more in uh, philosophy, philosophy of communication, mass communication, uh, et cetera. Um, and so there are two, there were really two things that came out of my doctoral career um, that have influenced uh, my scholarship uh, from that point uh, on. The first was um, something I didn't like when I was in graduate school, which is I had a professor who um, was very critical of uh, quantitative social science methodology. Um, but his point of view was if you were going to be critical of these things as a uh, research method, um, that you should probably know it uh, as much, if not better, than those who utilized and practiced it. Uh, and so what that ended up meaning for me was uh, probably a collective about 20 to 24 hours uh, credit hours of uh, quantitative methods training throughout grad school. And those were everything from, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, sort of broad statistics courses to courses uh, in demography uh, and various types of social science, quantitative social science methodologies. Um, all of them I, I hated. Um, and uh, most of them I didn't get great grades in, uh, except for except for one where I may have managed to eke out a, uh, I think a B, um, was the best I could do. But that methods foundation was um, was crucial, um, and so it was broad and it was also adjacent to um, some of the other methods that I was being introduced to. Um, that were more critical in nature, more philosophy uh, based, uh, so on and so forth. The second thing that came out of that moment is I spent my time in graduate school uh, kind of doing two things. Number one, uh, my degree, um, but I also spent and kind of took a, uh, a sort of an overlapping detour for several years and worked in uh, 
politics and electoral politics in Oklahoma for about seven or eight years um, and was a uh, communications professional, communications director uh, for several uh, political campaigns uh, and for the state Democratic uh, Party um, uh, for a number of years. And so uh, had an interesting career. If anyone knows anything about uh, Oklahoma, you can, uh, you know, it's uh, staunchly conservative and Republican and white. Uh, and so it was interesting trying to do uh, left-leaning democratic politics in that uh, particular arena. Um, but it was the first time that I got introduced to what would be the current of my, uh, what I would say is sort of my first half of my career. Um, and that was the opportunity to work in my first campaign for a candidate who was running against a man named J.C. Watts, who was at the time uh, the first black Republican to run for Congress in the South since Reconstruction. Um, and so the interesting component about that dynamic, um, not only about having uh, uh, someone who was a black Republican, uh, but the prior election, his first election cycle, um, was fraught because a white Democrat had run a political ad uh, that was famously uh, controversial in uh, its uh, kind of uh, use of and reliance on racial tropes uh, for, uh, for that white candidate's uh, advantage. Um, and so when I entered this particular um, uh, contest, one of the things that my uh, candidate had asked me to do was try to ensure that we did not run afoul of uh, those kinds of issues, race-based issues uh, in our political campaigning and communications and appeals. Um, of course, we failed um, in a number of ways, uh, uh, but that's a, another story. But um, but that ended up being uh, the anchor of the work that I began to set out to do and the interest that really propelled uh, the first part of my career. And then um, one can see how the branches of that uh, expanded up through the research that I continue uh, to do now. Uh, so I came out of my, out of, uh, my PhD um, also with sort of two uh, sort of uh, branches or currents of, of interest. My doctoral dissertation was actually on um, uh, African-American death rituals, um, which became an interest uh, during my grad school career. And so that's what my dissertation was on, uh, an ethnographic study of uh, um, Black funerary traditions, uh, spent a lot of time uh, going to funerals and wakes and talking to um, funeral directors and looking at the political economy of uh, funeral practices in African American um, uh, neighborhoods and histories and so forth. Um, so that was an interest that was my dissertation and then ended up uh, coming through in two uh, books that I first uh, wrote. Uh, shortly after I graduated from uh, from grad school, um, I don't talk about them very much uh, these days. They were they were not very good, um, <clears throat> but it was sort of an inviting interest. And then alongside that was the interest in uh, race and political campaigns. And so this interest was really about um, what are the ways that political candidates. Uh, that political candidates mobilize race for political advantage. Um, and so most of this look at uh, advertising practices, uh, but also got to into uh, sort of representations of um, black political candidates in news and, and other um, outlets. But my question uh, at that time and interest was how do primarily white candidates mobilized race to disadvantage the election prospects of uh, black and other non-white uh, candidates of color. Um, 
and the overarching interest had to do with uh, issues around representation, around power, around civil rights. Um, and so how could something like uh, the structure and content of political messaging, political advertising really disrupt uh, the represent representational politics of black communities, um, disadvantage those communities, um, lessen the types of representative power uh, that could be exercised uh, in uh, black communities throughout uh, uh, really the 70s, 80s, and at the time that this work was going on was uh, basically up through uh, the early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> and so that work, you know, stretched from about, um, you know, the late 1990s um, up through um, the mid 2000s and, uh, and beyond. And what um, <clears throat> what set the stage for the, the kind of first transition in my work came around, um, well, number one, around, uh, I would say about 2003, 2004, maybe it was 2004, 2005, um, where, uh, of course, the internet uh, begins to uh, mature, uh, if you will, um, uh, in the early 2000s and the rise of uh, things like blogging um, and other forms of uh, user uh, generated content and ways for uh, users, uh, online users to connect, uh, build networks and do various types of things uh, online. Uh, and so early on around 2005, 2006, a colleague of mine, research colleague of mine, um, <clears throat> began to write a blog that was called This Week in Race um, and were one of the first um, uh, scholars to really do this kind of work, which was to produce a regular uh, blog. This one was re weekly, uh, whose aim was to uh, kind of bring a bit of a scholarly lens to everyday, everyday uh, racialized uh, practices that were going on and happening in society, both within and beyond uh, the sphere of electoral uh, politics. Uh, and so that was fun and tackling everything from, uh, you know, the, the use of the, the N-word, excuse me, to um, what was happening in uh, hip hop to, um, to what was going on in, uh, in Congress. Um, and so that spanned um, probably about three years of writing that blog before uh, we wound that down as a flood of other scholars be able, uh, uh, began to move into that um, space uh, and being, began to do similar work and frankly do uh, better uh, work uh, in that way. Um, and so we began to wind down and this was, you know, started to be around the time that uh, uh, pre, just before the 2008 elections, Barack Obama's first election. Um, and so a number of things were happening at that time that were um, influential in uh, my scholarly trajectory. Number one, um, uh, I had begun to see the ways in which many other folks like myself, uh, scholars, um, scholars that were inter, uh, uh, engaging with uh, activist communities, civil rights communities, et cetera, were beginning to transition much of their work um, online. Um, and so beyond engaging in uh, online context, I started to, uh, around that time, get uh, have an interest in uh, the medium itself. Uh, so not just what we were all doing online, but what this thing uh, online, what the internet uh, and all the things that were connected to it um, was and what it really meant uh, for some other broader questions. Uh, the second thing in that particular time period, of course, was everything that was happening online around the election of uh, Barack Obama. Uh, so both the... Uh, the advanced data and digital practices of the Obama campaign that were um, 
uh, unique to electoral politics uh, at the time, but also all of the kinds of reputational and representational um, engagements around blackness, around race, uh, and Barack Obama at the time, particularly all the things that were um, negative and uh, all the things, uh, caricatures and so forth that linked uh, him to all kinds of uh, narrative uh, or negative stereotypes that we're uh, all familiar that have long been connected to black folks. Um, <clears throat> and so all that was boiling as I was in writing uh, uh, my next book, which was Race Appeal, um, which came out, uh, I think in maybe 2011, 2010, 2011. Um, but in 2008, I had, um, we had both, you know, uh, written the, the foundation for Race Appeal. Um, I'd also in 2008 got tenure, went on sabbatical, had my son. Um, and so, you know, what was an interesting moment of transition that began from 2008 and really stretched to about 2014. And so what you see if you look at my CV is, um, you know, a flurry of things around uh, 2008, 2009 or so. Uh, but then a big gap from about 2009 all the way till 2014, where it looks like um, I did nothing but take a, a long vacation, uh, which uh, I did not. Um, but what I was doing was starting to um, prepare myself and kind of retool for a different set of research questions that began to really interest and animate me. And so those were moving away from electoral politics, but still trying to understand broad questions around race, civil rights, structural inequality and discrimination and how those things play out. And so the playing field of that shifted from electoral politics and began to start shifting to the digital arena and to the internet in particular. Um, and so it was during that period where um, I began to not only kind of look around at different literatures, but also began to um, do some retooling methodologically, um, started uh, learning more about networks and doing network analysis, um, both the qualitative and quantitative ends of network analysis. Um, looking at a variety of different types of software um, that aided network analysis and other types of uh, quantitative data uh, analysis that are connected uh, to it. Um, and so that methodological piece um, was happening alongside of me thinking through different kinds of questions about where this connection and intersection of race and the digital really held interest for me. And so, um, you know, that range from everything at the beginning of thinking about um, representations of blackness online and its potential to uh, sort of affect um, uh, kids and their uh, uh, socialization around race and so forth. And so very interested in and for a time got immersed in the kind of psych psychology of race and how uh, kids begin to learn about race uh, from a very, very young age, really from infancy and thinking about um, uh, the, the, the way that the brain processes faces and color and human attributes and how that connects to the emergence of stereotypes and the emergence of uh, um, early young people's formations about um, what race is, what race me means, who's part of my in-group, who's part of my out-group, um, and building those kinds of pattern recognitions um, in both uh, uh, mental perceptions, but also in behavior as um, infants turn into uh, uh, toddlers and, and kids, young people, teenagers, and beyond. 
that was fairly brief, um, and I, I shifted away from that interest, um, and ultimately ended up um, trying to center questions around the internet. Um, and so what was interesting when I came to that question and began to investigate the literature that was out there, you know, I had a sense that, um, you know, the internet comes online around, what, 90, 93, 92, 93, um, for the public uh, at large. Um, this was, you know, 2011 uh, or so, so a long period of time that I figured then there would be a significant literature about the internet, about race and the internet, and some of these questions around race, discrimination, et cetera, that I was interested in. And to my surprise, um, I didn't find much. Um, I found some, and what I did find was the early work by folks like Lisa Nakamura um, and others who looked at early online um, digital culture and sort of the ways in which race and representation were um, uh, uh, sort of bound into uh, the very fabric of our first um, sort of online activities. Um, and so there was a lot of that. And, and in fact, that work, which had begun to be written, um, I think Lisa published her first work around 98, 99, something like that. Um, and was really looking at sort of um, Asian Americans in the internet context, introduced the ideas of um, identity tourism and the early ability uh, to be online and masquerade of, uh, as people of other identities, um, be that racial, be that gender or um, sexuality, people being able to take on a persona um, that was not authentically theirs and being able to do so in an environment, a new environment where people could, uh, who really did not know. And so um, uh, there was an, uh, an early cartoon and I'm, I'm forgetting probably the, the actual tagline, it, uh, but it was something about, um, uh, you know, no one knows that you're not a dog or something like that. Um, I'm bad at remembering, but a famous cartoon that was basically the point that um, this kind of invisibility that allowed this uh, trying on that went more or went well beyond just sort of play and experimentation and really was the basis of uh, uh, very harmful practices around discrimination and race-related violence that were playing out in online context, given this newfound ability to, uh, to hide, to masquerade, to, um, to, to take on other people's identities and then use those uh, identities for um, uh, very uh, negative, uh, negative things. So when I approach these questions, you know, in 2011, 2012, and started looking at the literature, I found that, and sort of the established, um, or what I found was established by that point, is you know still debated for a lot of people. But um, the 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 point that um, race from the beginning was part of the online world, um, racial discrimination, all those things we associated with it were there from the beginning countering the narrative of the internet as a, uh, um, a democratic space, a radically democratic space um, that invited greater participation in large part because people didn't have the kind of cues and signals and stereotypes associated with uh, skin color or uh, you know, racial, various kinds of racial attributes or gender attributes or what have you. Um, and so dispensing with that notion uh, very early on. Um, and so the question about sort of representation online, the ways that we engage race online, online was already settled in many ways by that point. But my question as I entered into um, uh, this area 
was more about the structure of the medium itself. And so my question uh, was more like, is the internet racist? Um, and if so, what would it mean to say that the internet is racist in the ways that we think about racism or that I think about racism, which is uh, less representational than though representation is certainly a part of it, but to think more about structure and power. And so the question for me is how does the internet then um, parallel a racist system that describes our existence uh, offline, quote unquote, um, and what are the signals within the medium that provide us evidence of uh, that kind of structural racism? Uh, and so how does race get structured in online context in ways that produce and reproduce uh, discrimination uh, that produce harms that are negatively accrued to uh, minoritized people. Um, those were the questions that I was really trying to understand. And there were two, um, uh, two pieces of work that I found that, uh, that really took up that question. Um, one was, um, I'm forgetting, forgetting his first name, his last name is Kong. Um, he's now at UCLA, I believe, um, as the, uh, the head of DEI, I believe, but uh, was a lawyer um, who around 1999, 2000, wrote a piece um, that was sort of outlining some of the parallels of offline discrimination and uh, their parallels online. And so trying to make these kinds of connections to try to understand how um, online discrimination works. Um, the other though that I found, and again, this was uh, probably 2011 or 12, um, but it was an, an article by um, Helen Niesenbaum um, and uh, another woman, uh, who I think Batya Friedman, um, and it was called uh, Bias in Computer Systems. And what really struck me were, were two things about that particular article. Number one, it was precisely the most precise um, scholarship at the time that I had found that was looking at the, the precise question that I was trying to understand, that is how does bias, discrimination, et cetera, structurally come to be embodied in a computer system and particularly the system that I was interested in called the internet. And so um, that was of interest because it was most precisely on target with the question I was interested in. The second was that the article had been written in 1996 before the internet was born. And so what you found in that article was very systemic uh, systematic way of categorizing and explaining um, and building a template for how racial bias gets baked into computer systems. Now, remember, this is um, long before um, uh, folks like Sophia Noble um, are writing about things like algorithms of oppression long before we have a nomenclature, popular nomenclature around um, bias and algorithms or bias in computer systems, all of those things. This was in 1996 before the internet as we know it um, is, um, uh, or sort of really part of the, the popular culture. And so what she does is look at other types of systems like airline systems, um, systems that were used uh, in college campuses to um, uh, uh, distribute uh, grades or to determine um, how classes were gonna be allocated for students uh, uh, to be enrolled um, and sort of laid out all the different ways in which various types of biases, racial being uh, primary among them, 
were structured in these kinds of systems and the outcomes that they produced. Um, and so that's where I then began to sort of take off and try to answer a similar question. I remember uh, that moment um, because at the time, Helen was uh, a colleague of mine at NYU. Uh, her office was right down the hall. And I remember one day going to her and saying, Helen, I'm really interested in this question around bias and computer systems. And I landed on this article of yours from 1996. Um, why is there nothing else <laughs> since from 1996 on to that moment in 2011, 2012? And she sort of looked at me and was like, I don't know. Um, and that was all I kind of got out of her. Um, and But that's where I picked up those particular sets of questions um, and began to start doing some focus investigation and study which began with thinking about um, networks um, and the ways that networks are built online, but really the network that we know as the internet. Um, so this becomes one question, which is, you know, is the internet racist? If so, how and how do we uh, parse out the structural elements of that in online context? My other question that I began to be very interested in is how do um, black folks, uh, minoritized folks use the internet and other digital tools for liberatory purposes, for resistance, for uh, furthering civil rights, uh, so on and so forth. And so um, in 2014 or so, um, I began to uh, start uh, writing and producing and publishing things again in and around this set of new uh, questions. Uh, and so I think around 2014, um, an article, um, uh, I wrote an article that was called Racial Formation, uh, the Political Economy, or what is it called? Racial Formation, Political Economy of uh, Online traffic or something like that. Um, and that was my attempt to begin to understand the economy of um, uh, web traffic, um, the relationship between websites, how those websites are um, produced, named, categorized systemically. Um, uh, and then the economy of how audiences and users flow and find their way from one website to another and looking primarily at racialized websites versus those that were ostensibly non-racial um, and making an argument for uh, the existence of, of course, a, a hierarchy of power dynamic that is about visibility um, and that visibility and the economy of visibility having certain outcomes that were both social, economic, et cetera. But this was one of the structures in which uh, black folks, black website producers, people that were producing online uh, content who were either black themselves or and or producing content that was racialized in a particular way um, were disadvantaged by the algorithms that privileged visibility um, over other things. And so producing this kind of what in networks, uh, in network science is called a, a power law, which is simply the old adage of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so seeing this economy um, play out in online context where the rich um, and the richer are of course, uh, white and white purveyors of uh, sites that are non-racial as opposed to the poor and the poorest, uh, those that are online uh, producers uh, who are non-white and producing um, content that is racialized in some way. So that comes out in 2014. In 2015 or 16, um, myself and uh, a colleague and friend, D Dean Freelon, um, and another colleague and friend, Meredith Clark, um, do a, um, uh, what I think was the first large scale investigation of um, 
Twitter and Black Lives Matter and trying to understand the emergence of Black Lives Matter and publish this uh, large report called Beyond the Hashtags, uh, the online search for offline justice. Um, and so it was a large scale, uh, I think, uh, that study, we had looked at 44 million uh, tweets for about um, a year, year and a half that covers um, everything from Ferguson to, um, uh, to Baltimore um, and everything in between in terms of uh, Black folks that were killed and then the emergence of online resistance that came to be known as Black Lives Matter. Uh, so that comes out in 2000, uh, 2016, and it's at that point, really, sometime in that uh, area um, that I began to be interested in the emergence of uh, Black Lives Matter in particular, but trying to understand the historical precursors to antecedents of Black Lives Matter, and that is what ultimately ends up as uh, Black software. Um, and so the book began as an interest in answering the question, how did we end up with Black Lives Matter? How did um, Black folks and other allied uh, people and groups so adroitly use digital tools to foment a movement that had such large impact and to have that emerge uh, seemingly out of thin air relatively? Um, that it sprang forward uh, quickly, grew quickly, uh, and had significant impact. In fact, uh, what I would argue is a greater impact than all of our civil rights organizing that had happened since uh, the late 1960s up to that uh, particular time. So what were the precursors of that? Um, that was a question I began to set out to understand and address. And my sense was that question began with the emergence of the internet itself in the early mid 1990s. And so um, for me, when Black Software began, when I began researching and writing, um, that was a time frame I was looking in, mid 90s up through the presence and trying to drive or uh, uh, dry a, a thread uh, between those. What happened early on in that work, um, and I'll, I'll describe it in the story of one of the, the key people that I met, and then I'll um, wind down so we can um, answer and do some questions and so forth. But um, I started off interviewing folks who were around working in producing um, during that time period, the mid uh, 90s uh, folks who were, um, were Black. And so I start off all my interviews kind of the same way with the question that was really just a conversation starter for me. And the question was, when did you first go online? And I figured that was a question I knew the answer to. It was gonna be somewhere 92, 93, 94, maybe later, but uh, something I relatively knew the answer to um, and really was just a way of kind of getting the conversation going. And so one day I stumbled upon a guy named William Morell um, and William Morell was the first person whose website I arrived at, um, you know, in what, 2014, 15, that looked like uh, it had been built in, you know, 1994 <laughs> or so, um, and hadn't been updated at all since, but was the first time I saw the term black software. So I was very interested in how he was defining that, what was, what was he trying to describe? And it wasn't clear from his site what that linkage was. And so I started off as I did with everyone, William, uh, when did you first go online? And he just kind of looked at me and was like, ah, well, you know, and he kind of hemmed and hummed and stumbled, stumbled quite a bit and finally said, eh, about 1978. I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, what and how are you online in 1978? What does it mean to be online in 1978? What the hell is going on? And so he described being um, uh, a technician at IBM um, and being the, you know, what we would call in today's nomenclature tech support 
but would be out in the field uh, troubleshooting IBM computer systems at a bank or another business or what have you. And IBM had built a, uh, a network for folks in the field to be able to communicate with those in their home offices or branch offices across the country uh, or in the, the near area. Um, and so for William, this was online. And it was, when you go back to history, um, the early computer networks that were smaller internets, if you will, um, that were the precursors to the internet that we know of today. So long story short, William was the, the first time and reason for me to begin ask another question, which was, forget Black Lives Matter, what is and has been the longer relationship um, of Black people to computing systems? And how does that history and relationship then help us to understand, define, explain things like Black Lives Matter? And so, um, Stephanie, having read the book and any others um, that have, you know that um, I end up talking about Black Lives Matter and Twitter and all those things. Uh, for a few pages at the very end of the book. Um, and that is it, and that is because the book became something larger about this historical relationship um, that for me became uh, uh, a challenge to tie in two key stories explaining a swath of history that began in the early 60s and ends around the end of the 1990s. One part of that story are the black computing pioneers uh, who I argue really built the internet as we know it, meaning um, added the layer of uh, culture and sociality uh, and all those things to an internet at the time that was launched with no sense of what it would or could be as a static information tool that Black folks then transformed into uh, uh, essentially a fundamental bedrock of uh, culture and cultural practice um, that, that made a lot of Black folks money for a short period of time, uh, and then that made a lot of white people money from that point in time up through our present, largely leaving out um, Black and non-white uh, creators and so forth ever since. So that was one part of the story. The other story is that story that I call computing, uh, computing's origin story. Uh, and that is that clash in the 1960s where you have the rise of computing, but also the rise of civil rights, those two things clashing in computing systems being marshaled to solve the problem of black people, black protests, uh, black people trying to uh, fight for their civil rights uh, and that becoming the linchpin of what has over 40 to 50, 60 years now, our uh, police surveillance infrastructure uh, that begins in earnest in the early 1960s and gets perfected from that time till now. Uh, and so that's the other part of the book and trying to meld those two stories together became the, the challenge and task for uh, that book, uh, Black Software. And um, I like to say, you know, I've been ever since trying to, to, to just go back and understand what I wrote there because if, you know, again, if you've read it, you know that it is uh, extremely narrative in nature, a lot less analytical. Um, but a lot of analytical stuff to pull out of it. And so it's been fun for me to be able to go back time and again to that book and try to understand and rearticulate um, uh, some of the through lines and things that I think are important there. So talked a little much longer than I thought I would, uh, but I'm gonna stop there and happy to uh, uh, answer questions about anything in there or anything else that I didn't really touch on or talk about at all that might be of interest to any of you. That was super helpful. It actually 
contextualized a lot of things in the book that I, I while I was reading, I was still looking for the linkages. So that was mm -hmm. super helpful. I mean, I have one really weird question that comes right. directly from the book. I don't know if you've been yeah. asked this. Why crack? <laughs> Why crack? Ah, it can take a long time to answer this question. It was, <clears throat> it's interesting because for me, that was probably one of the, the most important chapters of the book. Um, but everyone from my wife, who is a great writer and editor, to my editors at Oxford were like, why this? <laughs> and I said, it has to absolutely be there. It's got to stay. For me, it was, it was a way for us to try to, it was a way for me to try to explain the concept of Black software to people who, of course, had no context for understanding the linkage between what seemed like something that is completely unracialized if we think about computing hardware, software, et cetera. People who didn't have a framework or language or uh, just unable to really articulate how one could see technology as racialized, right? So, so the, the crack cocaine linkage was a way for me to kind of um, step out of computing vernacular, but still remain within uh, a technological vernacular to see something that was also a technology when we look at when we look at the chemistry of crack cocaine, cocaine itself, um, which is a, a chemical technology, right? Um, so still within a technological framework, but how do we think about the issues of both racialization and power connected to a technology? And so the crack cocaine piece became my analog to be able to try to help explain that. That is, how does something uh, that is a chemical product, a technology, take on um and become racialized and of course the way it does so is everything about um the context the social nature of the technology that gets produced and so the fact that uh, uh cocaine had a use within a certain context of people that was largely white largely wealthy in this context, largely part of the technological elite in Silicon Valley, um, this was the kind of racialization um, that I wanted to describe. And then on the contrary, uh, on the other side, the uh, permutations into crack cocaine that then had an economy in its use and distribution in a very different context, in contexts that were black, that were poor, um, not powerful, um, beginning in uh, Oakland, California, adjacent to Silicon Valley, but then really being um, distributed south to uh, South Central uh, Los Angeles, and then obviously across uh, the country and world, but still primarily in racialized um, urban uh, uh, neighborhoods that were largely black uh, and brown neighborhoods and the kind of policing and criminality that went along with that. So, so my attempt was to say, if what makes cocaine a white drug, crack a black drug, that we deal with very differently in terms of our perceptions of the drug itself, our perceptions of its users and the what comes to bear in terms of our policies and power on the users and context of those two different drugs that are differential um, uh, based on race. 
it's that same dynamic that makes software, hardware, computing technology, not only racialized, but racialized in ways that distinctly um, have differential power relationships um, uh, based on the relationship of certain people to the technology itself and the comportment of people to the technology. And so thinking about then the 1960s when computing technology that begins to be built is um, completely white. It emanates from white spaces and universities that black folks didn't have access to, didn't have access to the kinds of education in uh, uh, areas of uh, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, were locked out of the kind of conversation, both of the production of computing technology and decisions about how that technology would be marshaled. And so uh, my argument is we began the origin story of computing as an origin story of uh, a technological whiteness that sees blackness in, in opposition um, as a problem and that then black people become the, uh, uh, the problem, or I'm sorry, black people become the problem that computing technology is set out to solve. And what then transpires is building these uh, computing networks uh, that ultimately criminalize black people, surveil black people, um, and that that is all happening um, at the origin point of modern computing and in, in my view and argument, uh, structures the relationship of Black people to computing technology writ large from that point on, where we're talk whether we're talking about um, uh, systems that help to criminalize and overly police and incarcerate Black people uh, to other types of technology that lock us out of um, opportunity uh, in varying ways uh, from uh, criminalization to uh, things like uh, housing, which I forgot to really bring in, but has a component there that uh, is, is linked. There's a lot to unpack with that. <laughs> um, I, and I also do wanna hear about housing, but before, before we go back to housing, um, Dawn is here. Shu, I don't know what happened to Shu, but the two of them are working. I'm going to take a step back. As part of our project for the Counter Canyon Challenge, we um, get invited to modules, uh, courses, um, where we invite students to take up the challenge of citing 20% racialized scholars. Mm -hmm. um, in their summative assignments, so in their final assignments. Um, in their reference list. Uh, and then we score those reference lists uh, using a typology of racialization that we've developed. And each type of racialization has its own method for, um, for getting the designation of like a racialized citation. Um, yeah, mm. so we won't get into all of that. Yeah. But one of the things that we've been tasked with, one more thing, we have primarily done this challenge in um, in courses that are primarily focused on like essays as their summative assignment. Mm -hmm. So they have very conventional outputs, but John and Shu have the very difficult task of um, basically redesigning the project for uh, quantitative research methods. And John has the very fun task of being a guest lecturer in core quantitative research methods. And the idea there is, John, if you want to hop in at some point, um, the idea is two parts as far as I know. Um, I, I'm a mentor on it, but I'm not a coordinator on it. Um, that first to introduce, to introduce students to racialized scholars who write about quantitative research methods. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we started this project is because um, one, the, the head of our department said that. 
um, racialized scholars don't write quantitative research methods. Um, and so we were invited to do this. And then the other part was, so there's like the citations portion of it, but like the databases themselves, the way that they had the, the conveners of the quant sections um, had considered this was to look at databases about racialized people. But a lot of those databases came from white scholars. And so the data produced the sort of white gaze. And so then we've been sort of rethinking that, thinking about databases from racialized scholars. And so this is the work that we're trying to do. Um, if you want to help us with that project, it'd be super helpful to hear your initial thoughts. I also recognize that Jacqueline has her hand up. So maybe we should take Jacqueline's question first. Yeah, yeah, happy to hear the question and then I'll come back to that as well. Yeah, I'm really interested in that because um, I do a lot of quantitative stuff. So that would be so good if, if, I mean, whatever you found, not that I might be able to help with it, but yeah, I'd be definitely interested in that because that intersects with my research area. I look at um, ethnic differences in physical activity behavior change. So a lot of my data sets are looking at differences between black participants and white participants. And obviously I'm a black researcher, so I'd be so, so into that. And I do a lot of quantitative research. Yeah, that's 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 interesting. Um, I would I would love to follow your project as you as you continue to it, and you know, I'm happy to contribute any way that um, would be helpful. It's it's interesting to to think about. Um, I don't know the the erasure in some ways um, because there are a number obviously of um, racialized scholars who do quantitative work who do fiercely quantitative work in a lot of ways there are a lot of uh, racialized scholars who work uh, in the intersections of those folks like myself that uh, have connections to an array of methods, quantitative being uh, one of them, but also uh, connections across different methodologies. Um, and, and so I think this question about method and quantitative methods and race is um, extremely interesting. And I think, you know, one of the things that you, you know, you bring up in your framing of this is you know, precisely one of the things that I was trying to conjure in the concept of, of Black software that encompasses things um, uh, that are connected not only to sort of quantitative social science methods, but quantitative in uh, the, the thinking about computing, um, and the, the writing of code and other types of quantitative formations that go into um, and figure into our, uh, our current sort of computing uh, context uh, broadly. Um, where we think about, uh, where there are many ways to think about race and quantification, both in terms of the scholars doing it and the way in which they mobilize quantitative tools. Um, and that has everything to do from, you know, what we choose as data to how we transpose and work with that data, process that data uh, in varying ways. And so I'm thinking about, you know, much more to my kind of prior work um, in electoral politics that was, um, you know, years of me doing um, randomized experiments um, or doing quantitative, uh, uh, large-scale quantitative uh, content analysis and having to try to understand and parse out the meaning of certain types of variables. And so what do we really mean when we talked about um, something like, um, you know, political motivation as an independent variable um, and being able to talk about 
what this means for people who are studying black folks as an object um, versus people who uh, uh, study study scenarios in which black people are involved, but not only in the context of being an object of study. Um, a lot of this is kind of um, uh, abstract, but I think it very well. But it is to say, to think about racialized people being involved in the same practices, but bringing with that uh, a kind of interrogation about the methods itself that are about race as a way of disrupting traditional ways that social science quantitative methodology has been marshaled to um, uh, make very erroneous and draw very erroneous conclusions about black life, black culture, black people uh, that further marginalize and disadvantage. Um, but then on the other hand, I think to this question of the database and data bases that are built, I think that's an interesting one to think about in this context of race and, and quantification and what it really brings to mind in, in a lot of ways was a lot of the work by scholars and others um, sort of post Black Lives Matter to build databases that were representative or about other things. So the folks that were building databases on um, white cops who are uh, committing police violence against black people, right? So different types of databases that then um, allow for different types of analysis and uh, engagement with different types of questions uh, that rearrange the kind of subject object uh, uh, power relationships that are embedded with uh, these quantitative methods. So, so none of that, um, I, don't, I think, answers any of the, the question that you answer, but um, to sort of say, I think there's a lot of interest and uh, import that's bound up in that question about race, quantification, racialized scholars, and quantitative methods. Um, and clearly, a lot of what's missed in terms of uh, racialized scholars utilizing the methodology um, and utilizing those tools uh, for what and so forth because my you know my experience at least with the first um, uh, you know 10 to 12 years of my work were uh, you know all with with majority um, scholars of color uh, who did quantitative work um, in and beyond the, the political arena. There's so many overlaps with all of this in just my paid work and my academic work. Uh, before yeah. you get into housing, <laughs> yes, I'm really, I'm really curious as to how you're taking this into uh, data and society um, because my paid work on transition. Um, I work for an abolitionist organization that advocates for alternative public safety programs. My primary mm -hmm. role is coming up with counter arguments um, to conceptual stre uh, stretching in, in quantitative data analysis against police um, narratives of their police data uh, or mm -hmm. of public safety data. And mm -hmm. the <laughs> other part of the work that I do is that I, I'm embedded within this uh, alternative public safety program called Cambridge Heart. And the, that program is in the process of developing its like monitoring evaluation plan. And my job is using mixed methods to develop the KPIs. Um, and yeah. as part of that, we're trying to think long-term and construct two types of databases. One is uh, dashboards rather. Um, one dashboard that's just meant to illustrate like the actual data from the work that the Cambridge Heart responders do. The other one, which is the part that I'm, I'm doing more work on is collecting data from the community, definitions of community safety, and then redeveloping um, uh, 
the KPIs for community safety more broadly um, within the community. And so we, we did some preliminary um, data gathering and we, you know, when we were like, hey, um, at a mutual aid event, you know, we're like, how do you define community safety? And this was largely like low income folks and they said, you know, job security, housing. It wasn't mm. the number of minutes it takes a police officer to arrive to my household. It wasn't the number mm. of police officers um, who arrive on scene or the duration of um, police interaction. <laughs> it wasn't any of the quantitative metrics that the public safety um, currently collects to justify the number of police officers and the increase in police budgets. Um, and so it's really interesting to hear you talk, um, ask these questions in, in the context of my having to mm -hmm. um, do this work and also really appreciate the connection. I feel like now more secure, uh, the connection between the, the um, evolution of policing software, e-surveillance software, and the quantitative research method. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. really like solid in, in terms of my understanding. So that was just my rant of like everything that I got from all of that. Yeah, that's gotcha. But I'd love to hear more about housing. Yeah. Um, so I'll connect in, in, in two threads quickly. Number one, you know, data and society you, you brought up. Um, and it's it's interesting your project, which um i would love to know more about um so interestingly enough my uh next meeting coming up here in a few minutes is with uh part of the team at data and society um trying to frame a discussion for uh the rest of the board at our next board meeting that has to do with um uh with the organization's new mission and strategy part of which has its aim to think about reconfiguring power and participation and thinking about uh, data and algorithmic systems. And so one of the things that happened, um, you know, a year or so ago, um, uh, when I first uh, came on the board and the organization was in the middle of formulating its new strategy, um, and it was very much in a vein about wanting to be um, in communities, to have community participation, uh, to really think through some of these things. And one of the things I said early on was, I think we really have to rethink what we see as our relationship to communities in as much as we are framing the mission of the organization because um, we don't want to be as an organization not able to fulfill a mission by being misaligned or being naive about what that mission is. And so when you say participation, let's try to unpack what partition, participation really means and if this organization is really set out and cut out to be a kind of participatory organization in that way. Um, and of course, much of what I was signaling is it's not. Um, and so let's rethink what these things mean. And so that's part of the work that we're doing now, which is precisely about some of those things that you talk about, which is are, is this organization the right organization to be standing in front of um, uh, folks in public housing and saying, what is it, what is it, do you, what do you need or how would you uh, reconfigure this algorithmic system? And how do you respond as an organization when someone responds and say, says job security? Perhaps this is not the precise playing field we need to be on. Perhaps we need to position ourselves as a bridge and in collaboration with other organizations that are closer in their mission and proximity to um, people at this sort of community level. Anyway, all those things I think very much uh, uh, kind of lined as uh, interesting questions, both for the org, but also broadly speaking, when we think about um, 
creating new data, creating new databases, creating new um, systems, um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so housing, I'll briefly uh, uh, just sort of bring in this in my work. I've always been in, um, interesting in, interested in housing because of its spatial component and because so much of housing and space form the um, foundation of how racial discrimination has been systematically and structurally uh, codified in um, uh, certainly in US society, but I think this travels uh, probably most places across the world. Space in a lot of ways makes race, space and place and housing and all those things are tied together in terms of how discrimination is um, produced and reproduced. Um, so that's always been occurred at that 2014 article that I talked about racial formation and the uh, inequality of web traffic. Um, the foundation of that is a spatial one. And so I think about the, uh, the, the sort of the logic of space, place and housing to draw parallels to internet online space and how that was built up and how people traveled in and through space the kind of value associated with different online digital spaces uh, in the economy of uh, that kind of spatial uh, network. Um, so that uh, kind of has permeated my work. Um, and then um, in, what was it? It was maybe 20, 2009 or so, um, I had gotten approached by um, uh, was it legal Brooklyn Legal Services and then a group of uh, lawyers uh, working on housing discrimination, uh, and they asked me to serve as an expert witness um, in uh, a set of housing discrimination claims uh, that were really about. Um, racial targeting, or you may have heard the, the phrase of redlining. Um, and so a new kind of concept of reverse redlining, which is, you know, redlining was about uh, sort of locking out certain neighborhoods from um, uh, financial participation in the housing market, and so forth. Um, and so the uh, uh, reverse redlining is really about racial targeting and so was about how black and brown folks are targeted for uh, various types of predatory mortgage um, products and practices. Um, and so, um, you know, long story short from about 2009 uh, to, I don't know, maybe 2018, 2019, um, I had served as an expert witness um, in several uh, legal cases uh, about these. Um, uh, and uh, these cases were very instrumental in kind of solidifying uh, this kind of legal theory around um, racial targeting or reverse redlining um, in the courts, but has been, uh, so my role in this was to look at the advertising practices and um, draw conclusions about um, banks targeting of black and brown um, communities and individuals in those communities as, target, as, as targets for these predatory um, loan products. Um, and so most of those really dealt with kind of legacy media, um, meaning advertising in newspapers, magazines, print media, by and large, television to some degree. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, that's been the kind of landscape where uh, I've been engaged in that particular way. And then um, that has led to the emergence in my um, scholarly work in kind of the next frontier, which is the, the digital advertising landscape. 
and the same concepts around reverse redlining or racial targeting um, in advertising technology uh, networks. And so similar questions around who gets targeted for uh, things that cause harm um, based on where they live. And that is live both in uh, physical geographical space, but also how that's tied to their movement in and through online space. So much more to talk about about that in housing, but uh, ha has long been, as I said, an interest uh, for me, for sure. Thank you so much. This was this was so great for me, at least. <laughs> um, it looks like we should stay in touch and continue to um, have these yeah. sorts of conversations. So thank you. Absolutely. For Happy to be with y'all anytime and uh, happy to, 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 for you to reach out and uh, stay connected on uh, anything that can be helpful with. Do you mind sending over some of those articles that you mentioned um, in particular? I mean, yeah, that 2014 yes. article, but also the Dean Freeland, Freeland article. I haven't, I don't know about it. Yeah, I will yeah. send all those over to you and uh, feel free to share them as you wish. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Good to see you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.